This is Tipperary Town, built on a tributary of the shore and a settlement since the 1190s. In 1911, Tipperary had a population of nearly 7,000 and was a market town benefiting from a fertile hinterland, the Golden Vale. Milk was produced in abundance so that butter production was at the heart of the community's prosperity. Tipperary was a town also at the heart of the events that made the second decade of the 20th century so extraordinary. Because there was an important military barracks and, of course, that song, the Great War had a particular impact. One of the most active and famous IRA brigades, the 3rd Tipperary, was founded in and drew its strength from the district. The impact of militant labour was also a feature of this period. During the Civil War, Tipperary was briefly a Republican stronghold, until captured in battle by Free State forces. What began in song ended with fire. This is the story of those years. On Saturday the 3rd of April 1910, John Redmond, MP, leader of Nationalist Ireland, arrived in Tipperary Town. His purpose was to speak at a political rally on the following day to encourage the government party in Britain to reform the House of Lords and actively support Home Rule. Canon Arthur Ryan of the Scartine family, the parish priest, was a friend and the Redmonds were his guests on Saturday night. There was no question of the Irish leader and his wife arriving quietly. Once darkness had fallen, there was a torchlight procession, led by the Kickham Band, still going strong, ending up outside the parochial house in St. Michael Street. The crowd refused to disperse until they heard from Mr. Redmond, and so he spoke to them from an upper floor window facing the street, saying exactly what the crowd wanted to hear. Tipperary, with Wexford, were the best counties in Ireland, and knowing that he had the support of Tipperary people made all the difference to him. Thousands of people attended the great public meeting the following day, held in New Tipperary, and it garnered considerable publicity, including the front page of the Illustrated London News. No one was shouting, up the Republic. Local leadership could not have been more supportive of John Redmond, the Irish Parliamentary Party and Home Rule. Here we see, as younger men, Redmond with John Cullinan from Bansha, the local MP, and Daniel Kelly, leader of the Urban Council. Canon Ryan, the parish priest, supported a distinctive Irish identity as manifested by such organisations as the GAA, and most especially in his case, the Gaelic League, while politically wanting rid of the Act of Union and the restoration of a native parliament. If you want a homely image, this was a wish for separate bedrooms, not distinct households. There was another point of view. In the south of the town, the area of Cordangan, from a population of 2,800, a remarkable 860 were not Roman Catholics and very definitely not nationalists. Two institutions explain this. The military barracks and the Erasmus Smith Grammar School, known as the Abbey. And Cleves Creamery was managed by a member of that family, a Protestant Unionist. Change, if it came, looked like coming slowly. The campaign for Home Rule, of which the Tipperary meeting was a part, generated a backlash. Most dramatically, two years later, in 1912, Ulster's Solemn League and Covenant signed by around half a million people, including three individuals in Tipperary town. Members of the Keith family living at 8 Abbey Street and originally from Belfast. Living beside Mr. Keith was a retired constable of the RIC, and beside him a post office clerk and family, members of the Church of Ireland. Both institutions, the RIC and the Church of Ireland, were bulwarks of the status quo. It was symptomatic that the head constable of the RIC was not Roman Catholic. The British colonial expertise was in plucking young men from the land and drilling them, literally and otherwise, into the front line of defence for the political status quo. Naturally, the parish priest chaired the great public meeting at which John Redmond came to speak. There was no doubt that the near future would bring home rule, a view supported by the letter from Archbishop Fennelly that was read to the gathering. 
What could go wrong? Built in the 1870s, the infantry barracks in Tipperary, immediately adjacent to the railway station, was temporary home to a succession of battalions from mainly English regiments. For a few years in the middle of the first decade of the 20th century, the regiment based at Tipperary Barracks was the Lancashire Fusiliers. A young man from that recruitment area, J.E. Schofield, was sent with some colleagues to augment the 4th Battalion already in Tipperary. Unusually, he left a written record of his experience in Tipperary, part of the United Kingdom and yet quite foreign. Within the enclosed world of the splendid barracks, a military garrison which at the height of empire could just as well have been in Jamaica or India. His life had very little to do with the town, which was the point. This isolation changed with the outbreak of war in August 1914. The regiment in situ, the Shropshire Light Infantry, the first battalion of which was in Tipperary since the previous year, hurried back to England. Recruitment was the order of the day, and a barracks built for several hundred men soon had to accommodate thousands. Immediately, the workhouse was requisitioned, and on a nearby site at Scalaheen, temporary housing for around 1,500 men was put in place. The primary collective into which nationalist recruits were poured was the 16th Irish Division, headquartered in County Cork, but with the training of one of its brigades, the 49th, based at Tipperary. County Tipperary was within the recruitment area of the Royal Irish Regiment, with its depot at Clonmel, and it was to there that the local recruits were directed. Whereas previously Tipperary Barracks was occupied by a single battalion, now in 1914-15 there were four, the 7th and 8th Battalions Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and the 7th and 8th Battalions Royal Irish Fusiliers. During these months, with enthusiasm for the war still widespread, and with thousands of men being prepared for hell. Alcohol and sex were the twofold interfaces between military and community. By the summer of 1915, the recruits were gone, first back north and then to the killing grounds across the channel, where it was quickly discovered that their temporary training was anything but adequate. By now, Tipperary was not just an army barracks. It had become a brand. Thanks to endless choruses of It's a Long Way to Tipperary, belted out by footsore Tommies, that song, written as a throwaway piece of music hall entertainment just before the war, became and remained the musical notes that called to memory and imagination those terrible years. By the end of 1915, Jack Judge had earned some 200,000 euros in royalties probably a fraction of what he was entitled. All the time while the song was gaining traction, the establishments, musical and political, hated it, hated how such a nothing little song became emblematic of a nation and of a cause. There was propaganda value to be drawn from the truth that the popularity of Tipperary came from the ground up. It was the people's choice. The brand Tipperary became attached to a wide variety of things a child's book extolling the merits of Tipperary Tommy. Cigarettes, of course. A milk-based tonic called Sanogen, a competitor to the German-made Sanatogen. And, launched in April 1915, HMS Tipperary, but sunk at the Battle of Jutland on the 1st of June 1916. With the 49th Brigade dispatched abroad, another use was found for Tipperary barracks. Early in 1916, supported by a very active local committee, Tipperary Barracks became the Tipperary Command Depot, a centre for the rehabilitation of wounded soldiers. On the 5th of April 1916, a huge fundraising event was held at the Town Hall, enthusiastically supported by the parish priest, Arthur Ryan, in what must have been the single largest fundraising effort in the community. An astonishing sum was raised, 
worth perhaps 100,000 euros in today's terms. The sight of so many wounded men about the town naturally deterred army recruitment and was evidence that the empire was not all powerful. That was the 5th of April, but on the 24th of April everything began to change as rebels seized the GPO in Dublin. It could be argued that the single most important public meeting ever held in Tipperary Town took place at this venue on Sunday the 10th of May 1914. As you may see from the proud display, this was the Electric Theatre, also known as the Tivoli, and showing moving pictures since 1912. Decorated with bunting and banners and with accommodation for several hundred, the crowd spilled onto the street and shared in a sense that something historic was underway. And it was. This was the chosen venue for the inaugural meeting of the Irish Volunteers in Tipperary Town and District. A volunteer movement had been launched in Dublin the previous November, with Owen McNeil as frontman. This was a reaction to the Ulster Volunteers, founded at the start of 1913, to oppose Home Rule. Through the early months of 1914, what had started in Dublin spread across the country, and on the 10th of May it was the turn of Tipperary Town. Nationalists were divided. Home Rulers, then in the Ascendant, and Republicans, very much not. At this Tipperary meeting, a balance was kept. Dr. J.F. O'Ryan, former chair of the County Council, was elected to preside over the event, being proposed by two local businessmen, Daniel Kelly, Home Ruler, proposed, and P.J. Maloney, Sinn Féinor, seconded. In order to encourage the spread of the movement, a few men were there from the Central Committee in Dublin, one of whom was Sean McDermott, then and later with his primary loyalty to the IOB, a secret oath-bound organisation dedicated to removing the British from Ireland by force. His chief contact in Tipperary was Willie Benn, who lived around the corner from the venue of the meeting. As may be seen, his cycle business was within sight of the Maid of Erin, a monument to commemorate the Manchester Martyrs. Apart from the meeting in the Tivoli, on which all attention was centred, McDermott met privately with Ben and others of like mind, with a less accommodating agenda in mind. The meeting likely took place here in the Tipperary Club, a short distance from both the Tivoli and Ben's business, and over the following years, a home from home for Republicans. No surprise that it was raided several times by Black and Tans, and then shut down during the War of Independence. This picture from October 1917 is possibly the most interesting photographic evidence from this decade as it relates to Tipperary. No organisation was more influential than the Gaelic League in connecting many young people with their Irish identity. For some, that connection found expression in militant republicanism. Ironically, the great promoter of the Gaelic League in the parish was that great supporter of Home Rule, the parish priest Arthur Ryan. Apart from Irish language classes, plays were performed, with, of course, history lessons. O'Donnell's Cross was one such period piece, hence the costumes. In the back row, very much not in costume, and between two fine plumed hats, is Dennis Lacey, who was killed in action on the 18th of February 1923. Also in the back row, on your extreme left, is Sam Fahey, a Galway man and teacher at the monastery. His brother was Cian Corla for many years in the Doyle. To Lacey's right is Tom Bellew, a loud man and active, very active in the IRA. He came to Tipperary as a tinsmith at the Creamery. In the middle row, three men exemplified the tragedy that will unfold. Again, as you look at the picture, third from the left is Sean Duffy from Monaghan and in Tipperary as a draper's assistant at the arcade, captain of one of the two IRA companies in the town, he was killed in action on the 1st of May, 1921. Sixth from the left, his small stature, very obvious, is Martin Sparky Breen, leader of a Republican flying column. He was killed by Free State bullets on the 10th of January, 1923. 
immediately beside him is Sean Allen, executed in Cork Jail on the 28th of February 1921. Also of interest are two of the women in the picture, sisters Katie and Alice Ryan, friends of Sean Tracy, stalwarts of Common Amman, whose shop at 8 Church Street was the premises most often raided by the police. Sean Tracy was due to marry their niece before the faithful and fatal encounter at Talbot Street intervened. In Tipperary, as elsewhere, the volunteers split because of the Great War. The majority followed John Redmond and many joined the British Army. For dozens of those young men who did their duty as they saw it and who called Tipperary home, their epitaph became, In Flanders' fields, the poppies grow, Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. The minority of the volunteers who rejected Redmond were both elated and dashed by the news from Dublin during Easter week in 1916. Two was an unlucky number for members of the RIC in the Tipperary district. Two policemen were shot dead in Kilross in 1916. Two policemen were shot dead in Salahed Beg in 1919. And two policemen were shot dead in Tipperary town in March 1922. Among the often forgotten casualties of that week in 1916, were Sergeant Thomas O'Rourke and Constable John Hurley of the RIC, who were shot and killed by Michael O'Callaghan in a farmyard at Monaur near Kilross. For the British, it was panic time. Subversives, those in whom official eyes had been cast, were arrested and deported. The six so designated in Tipperary included two future TDs, PJ Maloney and Louis J. Dalton. Incidentally, in a complicated relationship while Maloney was just seven years older than Dalton, in 1916, Dalton married Maloney's stepdaughter. Families. The only one of the six who, from a British perspective, merited locking up was Willie Benn, who, along with the others, spent much of 1916 deported, so to speak, to the mainland. The executions of the 1916 leaders transformed public opinion change solidified by the United Nationalist resistance in 1918 to conscription to the British Army. A childhood memory for one Tipperary resident was St. Michael Street one Sunday morning, lined with tables, furnished with copy books and pencils for signatures, protesting the introduction of conscription. Later that year, Sinn Féin benefited from this anger when, with the Great War just over, a long-delayed general election was held. Campaigning was robust, again quoting that same childhood memory. I was passing by the parish church when I saw tarred in large letters on the wall across the road, Vote Maloney. These words tarred on every blank wall in the town became very familiar as they lasted for years. As evidenced by campaign posters such as this one for Pierce McCann, the past was invoked by both sides. Though in Tipperary town, Maloney had the advantage at least because his opponent, Banches John Cullinan, who had been MP since 1900, did not think that he needed to campaign and that his record would be enough. It wasn't. Active in the land war since the 1880s, jailed on numerous occasions, keen GAA activist, none of this mattered and his two and a half thousand votes were a far distance from Maloney's nearly 9,000. Cullinan died at the end of 1920, and lies in St. Michael's Cemetery. Ironically, perhaps, in the same row as the Republican plot. McCann was also elected, helped by the fact that he was in jail in England, where on the 6th of March 1919, he was one of the most high-profile victims of the terrible flu epidemic. At a meeting in a house on this site in October 1918, chaired by Richard Mulcahy, the 3rd Tipperary Brigade of the Volunteers, later known as the IRA, was established. Unexpectedly, Seamus Robinson, a man from Belfast, was made OC, with Sean Tracy as his number two. Over time, the brigade was organised into eight battalions, of which the 4th, based in Tipperary town, was the largest and most important. Signalling clear intent, as may be seen from Dan Breen's employment record, employed as a miles man with responsibility for rail tracks around Limerick Junction, since July 1913, he resigned in June 
1918. During the December 1918 campaigning for the general election, the focus was on the political movement Sinn Féin which left the volunteers at something of a loss. The leadership of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade decided on action, the seizure of explosives and whatever arms the escorts were carrying during their journey to a quarry at Salahed Beg. Part of the commitment to action was a willingness to shoot, which is not the same as an intention to kill. In any case, IRA weapons were often defective and there was a huge training deficit. On the 21st of January 1919, Constables MacDonnell and O'Connell were killed, and Robinson, Tracy and Green, the leadership of the 3rd Brigade, began two journeys. Flight, taking them out of Tipperary to Dublin, and Legend, a process whereby they became folkloric figures. The consequences for Tipperary Town and District were immediate and drastic. Three days later, commercial life was choked almost to death with the prohibition of fairs and markets. Social gatherings were also banned. Business could, however, be conducted as usual in Limerick or Clonmel. The training of the 4th Battalion continued as best it could. This and such activities as promoting the Doyle loan prompted a crackdown on IRA suspects. Names that were becoming well known, such as Martin Breen, Paddy Dalton, Tom Toomey, Morris Crow, Michael Fitzpatrick, Sean Duffy, Con Maloney and Sean Allen. It would be wrong to think that in such circumstances the entire community surrendered itself to Sinn Féin IRA. In the election for the Urban District Council in January 1920, with a turnout of 85%, Sinn Féin only managed 28% of first preference votes and 5 out of 18 seats. Labour, with 19% of first preferences, managed transfers very well and also won 5 seats. Voting for Sinn Féin in December 1918 was all about promises. Casting a vote in January 1920 meant dealing with grim reality. Dead policemen, special measures, house searches, arrests and economic restrictions. At the very end of March 1920, the war in and around Tipperary intensified with the arrival of some 30 new policemen, new to Tipperary and new to policing. These men who signed up to reinforce law and order in what, after all, was another part of the United Kingdom, found themselves out of their depth in what was a domestic colony. Not surprisingly, when their services no longer needed in Ireland, many of them, black and tans, took themselves off to Palestine, the British government having acquired yet another piece of prime real estate in its colonial enterprise. That summer, the military became increasingly engaged and the fiction that the police could manage was abandoned. Two regiments, the Lincolnshires and the Green Howards, around 1,200 men, operated from Tipperary Town with regular patrols and permanent detachments in some surrounding villages. Early that summer, three died, not at the hands of the IRA, but due to management issues. It was not until the Ula ambush on the 30th of July that the local IRA, led by Tracy, stirred itself and two soldiers from the Ox and Box Regiment were killed and the bodies brought to Tipperary Military Hospital, which serviced the surrounding countryside. The centrality of Tipperary Military Hospital to the fallout from ambushes and other engagements between the two sides, especially when bodies were being repatriated to England, meant that the town and its citizens were on the front line for retaliation. This was especially the case during the last months of 1920, when in the aftermath of ambushes such as Thomastown, Lisnagall and Glencoran, dozens of homes and houses were damaged or destroyed. In popular memory, a few individual deaths from this dreadful period are remembered. Sean Tracy, of course, on the 14th of October, Michael Edmonds on the 17th of December, and James Hickey murdered in the military barracks on St. Stephen's Day. Going into 1921, Building on previous restrictions, Tipperary was now under martial law, and one of its first victims was Sean Allen. Member of a family committed to the volunteers, he was arrested near Kilross on the 19th of January 1921. He was armed, 
and following a legal contest as to jurisdiction, civilian or military, the latter won, and Allen was executed in Cork on the 28th of February 1921. One of the features of these last months of the war, its duration of course not apparent at the time, was increasing IRA suspicion about information being given to the enemy. Volunteers knew their history, that in the past Dublin Castle used informers. During the New Tipperary conflict, for example, one of their regular informants was codenamed Rock. Usually before executing a spy, the IRA held a trial. On the 23rd of April 1921, the body of Timothy Cranley was found at Rosanna. When accosted by the IRA, he refused to go quietly, and in the struggle, he was shot. There was no doubt but that he had a relationship with the authorities, as official reprisals were ordered as a consequence of this killing. Six properties were ordered to be destroyed, which in urban areas, instead of being burnt to the ground, meant being all but demolished. This house was included. Its owner, Willie Ryan, Sinn Féin and Gaelic League rather than the IRA, was on a redundant list of usual suspects. Incidentally, this meant that he was on the list of individuals to be forcibly taken as hostages when army patrols ventured into the countryside. Ryan was one of the six arrested in 1916 and was interned at Balini Prison in Glasgow. On this occasion, 1921, he went to the military barracks, demanded to see the OC, Colonel Wilson, and presented his papers proving that he was an American citizen. His house was spared. On this site was the home of the Kwan family, again with members more GAA than IRA, but it was one of the houses designated for destruction. An eyewitness recalled a childhood memory with his brother going on a message for their parents. We were passing Kwan's at the corner of Dillon Street and O'Connell Road when a hand holding a hammer and an arm appeared through the roof and the slates started coming off being knocked from inside. It was an amazing sight. Then we saw the soldiers. They were wrecking the house instead of burning it. Not surprisingly, the replacement house is out of kilter with the rest of the street. Sean Duffy from near Castle Blaney in Monaghan arrived by way of having served his time in Clonmel and came to Tipperary to work at the Irish House. Exceptionally committed, he was OC of the 4th Battalion and also chairman of the local Board of Guardians. Paddy Maloney, on the other hand, was the son of the local TD and was also a staff officer on the 4th Battalion. It was unexceptional that some months previously, Black and Tans burned down Duffy's place of work and Maloney's home. When Duffy's mother sought compensation from the state, this was Sean Fitzpatrick's terse account of the incident, written in 1938. What it does not say is that their location was betrayed by an informer. There's a terrible story that when the two bodies, having been brought to the military barracks, were dumped in front of the officers' quarters, there was a sign of life in one and that Colonel Wilson's wife sent for the workhouse chaplain. The truce when it came on the 11th of July 1921 was welcomed. People, especially in Tipperary town, had been living on their nerves for some two and a half years. The streets filled with people and a long established town tradition. Tar barrels were set alight on the hills. Just like the political slogans left on walls, scorched grass on the hills long reminded townspeople of this interlude of celebration before fighting was renewed. Relations between the British authorities and the IRA were tense. In a place like Tipperary, it kind of occasioned no surprise that tension escalated to violence and death. On the evening of the 28th of September, 1921, an exchange of insults on the street escalated to a shootout in the town centre and resulted in a female bystander, a soldier from the Lincolnshire Regiment and a member of the IRA being wounded and one male bystander shot dead in front of the town hall cinema. With the IRA man, Joe Cahill, blamed by the British, a fortnight later some of his colleagues entertained a madcap idea to kidnap a black and tan having a drink and minding his own business in this pub. The result was more wild shooting, and the black and tan survived being shot in the head. An incident with potential political impact was the theft of weapons from the military hutmans on the 4th of November. 1921. One consequence of this was that it gave the 3rd Brigade greater freedom to reject the treaty the following month.
From the moment that news came through in early December 1921 that the treaty had been signed, there was a divergence of opinion between the leadership of the 3rd Brigade and the wider population. And when a month later the treaty was passed by the Doyle divisions hardened, while the majority had opinions, the IRA had guns. Dennis Lacey emerged as a powerful replacement for Sean Tracy and allowed no opposition, as this proclamation made very clear. The Republic had been declared, men had died in its name, and their sacrifice could not be subverted by politics or reality. On Thursday the 16th of February 1922, Tipperary military barracks was formally handed over to the IRA and the Lincolnshires marched out to the railway station and into Tipperary history. The previous day, the Hutmans were vacated by the Green Howards. The 4th Battalion of the 3rd Brigade, a little over three years since its creation, was now in charge of the district. It should be mentioned that there was the old and the new, those who had been there during the hard years of black and tan intimidation and auxiliary excess. And on the other hand, the new men in the IRA, the Trusilliers, those who had joined up and the threat level subsided and gloried in the glamour of it all. On Thursday the 2nd of March 1922, the last of the RIC withdrew from Tipperary. Thirty years earlier, during the battle over New Tipperary, when the town was saturated with peelers, it would have seemed unbelievable that within such a few decades that they would leave bag and baggage. Being Tipperary, there were scores to settle and gambles to be taken. The departing police had weapons and money. As the convoy turned left from St. Michael Street on their way to Dublin, they came under fire from the IRA, and with vehicles and men in flames, two policemen were killed. It appeared that some of the departing black and tans betrayed their colleagues. In this policing vacuum, the local IRA provided a very inadequate service, and crime increased. As seen in this press report from late March, townspeople seemed relaxed about the absence of police. The robbery the following month of the managers of the Bank of Ireland and National Bank in their personal capacities by three armed men focused attention on the issue. On a larger stage, the policing vacuum contributed to the crisis in labour relations, as did the sympathy of some IRA leaders such as Robinson for radical socialist measures. On the 12th of May 1922, workers took over Cleves Creamery. Cleves Company had done very well during the Great War, but by the early 1920s much less so, and workers felt that they were expected to bear an unfair burden. Farmers were not part of this socialist experiment, but many continued to supply milk, as long as they were paid. On the previous 4th of March 1922, workers at the Tipperary Gas Company that made and supplied town gas locked out the management and flew the red flag. Other creameries were also taken over, as was the Balnacorti estate in Ahalo, with its forestry enterprises. Tipperary Town, where shop assistants were well organised, experienced endless strikes, not just for better wages, but also to end the live-in system, which gave employers too much control over their employees. The shooting part of the Civil War began at the end of June 1922, when the pro-treaty side retook the four courts in Dublin. Doing its best to play a role in the national conflict, a relief column of a hundred or so men from the 3rd Brigade, led by Michael Sheehan from Dundrum, set off from Tipperary on the 1st of July. They never reached the capital, being engaged elsewhere when Dublin was lost to the Republicans. Seamus Robinson had been in Dublin and escaped. This was a sign of things to come, fragmented leadership and lack of strategic planning. We were out from school for lunch when we saw the Hutmans blazing. It was Friday the 30th of June 1922 and an indication that Tipperary Republicans were uncertain about holding the town. On that same day the four courts surrendered to Free State forces. With the loss of Dublin, anti-treaty hopes centred on the so-called Monster Republic, of which Tipperary was a key defensive stronghold. During July, the military barracks was the operational centre of the 4th Battalion sending some of their men to try and hold Limerick for the cause. One of the leaders was Con Maloney, son of the TD, 
and brother of Paddy killed in action a few months earlier. The Republican failure to hold Limerick, their inability to take Thurles and the loss of Waterford, followed by Carrick, Clonmel and Cashel, meant that Tipperary Town had no hope of holding out against the Free State Army. Consequently, the large buildings serving as soldiers' quarters in the military barracks and the police barracks were all set alight. At the close of July, hundreds of well-armed Free State soldiers closed in on the town. In other towns, with the approach of government troops, Republicans fled to the countryside, as happened, for example, in Clonmel on the 8th of August. In Tipperary, for whatever reasons, Republicans, led by Paddy Dalton, prepared to defend the town by erecting barricades, taking up defensive positions and laying down landmines. Best place of all, perhaps, a sniper in the Tower of St Mary's. In charge of the Free State soldiers was Dubliner Paddy O'Connor, whose decision not to use artillery allowed some respite to a much battered town. The battle for Tipperary began on Friday the 28th of July and that morning, as the road was being mined at Rosanna, three Republicans blew themselves up. There were James O'Mara from the town, Jeremiah Riggs from Latin and Patrick Butler from near Carrick. The location of mines was conveyed to the Free State soldiers by some supportive individuals who fled from the town and joined the enemy. Fighting continued until Sunday morning as the Free State soldiers had to take out strategic buildings such as those that commanded fields of fire. The point to be made about this battle is that under no circumstances whatever were the Republicans going to be able to hold the town, and it was of no help to the townspeople or advantage to their future that this homegrown IRA left so much destruction in its wake. There were deaths. Apart from the three mentioned, who at least were combatants, as were James Kinsler and John McIntyre on the Free State side, it's unclear whose side seven-year-old Julia French was on when she was shot dead while on her way to Mass with her grandfather that Sunday morning. As Republicans withdrew, mainly towards Ahalo, much destruction was left in their wake. What was left of the military barracks, bridges blown up, damaged water supply, and above all, Cleves Creamery, a smoking ruin, which, as one of their men subsequently admitted, was long held against them. Unsurprisingly, with the region under Free State control, Soviets, such as Tipperary Gasworks, quickly collapsed. Having lost control of towns, Republican fighters took to the countryside, using safe houses, living off the land, depending on local support and waging the kind of war that had been fought against the British. However, things were not the same. In many respects, the enemy, the Free State Army, was more ruthless than the British, and the countryside could no longer be relied on. During the following months, the destruction of infrastructure continued, especially the rail network, and Free State convoys came under attack. Unlike towns like Carrick and Clonmel, Tipperary escaped being sniped at from contiguous high ground. 1923 was a sequence of losses. Martin Sparky Breen was killed on the 10th of January, Dennis Lacey on the 18th of February. And in March 1923, after a gun battle, the Maloney brothers and Tom Conway were arrested in Ahalo. Jerry Kiley was killed on the 1st of April and Liam Lynch 10 days later. It might be argued that the beginning of a new stage in the town's history began on the 29th of March 1923 with the arrival in Tipperary of members of a new police force. Thirty minutes can hardly do justice to an extraordinary run of years. Hopefully, the point will have been made that few, if any, comparable towns in Ireland contributed more and endured as much as Tipperary in this complicated story of identity, freedom and compromise. One measure of Tipperary's part in this great national story is the loss of life. When this decade of centenaries is over, as a final gesture by the living towards the dead, a commemorative board will be put in place in the town. It will include 40 or so names, soldier and civilian, RIC and black and tan, free state and republican, and one child. All are part of the story of Tipperary Town and District during these years, when identities were tested, loyalties strained and sides taken, the tensions out of which our state was created. 